afternoon. My name is Joel Westfall, and it has been my great honor to serve as the Deputy Director of the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library Museum for nearly six years now. I would like to welcome all of you joining us either live on Zoom or the recorded version of today's lecture brought to you by the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library and Museum and the Gerald R. Ford Foundation, whose generous support to the library makes programs like these possible. Following the lecture, there will be a Q&A session. So please ask your question using Zoom's Q&A feature below. Today, all one has to do is turn on the television to witness one tragedy after another going on in Ukraine. The horrors of war are brought right into the living room with daily reports from reporters, social media, and our own telephones. We did not have this capability when it comes to the Russian Civil War. All we have are some still photos. Therefore, we rely on historians like our esteemed lecturer today to write narratives which bring history to life. In his latest book, Russia, Revolution, and Civil War, Sir Anthony Beaver takes us not only into the important meetings, but to the lives of the everyday man and woman as they struggled through this great tragedy. Many years ago, I wrote my master's thesis on the Don Cossack's role in the war. So reading Anthony's book brought back quite a lot of memories of my time in Rostov-on-Don doing research there. I could go on, but let's get down to business. Sir Anthony Beaver is one of those historians who literally needs no introduction. A master storyteller who has sold nearly 9 million copies worldwide. His books on Stalingrad and Berlin are seminal works. And his Second World War is one of, if not the best, single volume history of the conflict ever written. It has been my true honor to get to know Sir Anthony while working with him, setting this up, setting up this lecture, as well as the lecture on World War II back in February, which is available on our YouTube page. Ladies and gentlemen, Sir Anthony Beaver. Joe, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, sir. The Russian Civil War was certainly not a local affair. The conflict extended along the whole of the uh, the whole of the uh, Eurasian landmass from Central Europe to the Far East, and that's more than a sixth of the world surface, as uh, Soviet propaganda certainly uh, used to emphasize. Far from being merely an internal clash between reds and whites, it had immense geopolitical ramifications, with many countries and foreign troops, British, French, American, Czechoslovak, Japanese, Italian, Serbian, Greek, and Romanian. It affected all the former parts of the Russian Empire, including Finland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Central Asia, Siberia, and Georgia. And the Bolsheviks' Red Army included many units of internationalist volunteers, former prisoners of war from the German, Austro-Hungarian, and Bulgarian armies, as well as regiments raised from Chinese laborers, many of whom spread the Bolshevik creed on their eventual return home. The death toll of around 10 million civilians and soldiers, perhaps even as many as 12 million, had major international consequences. Red victory led directly to the era of savage totalitarianism, what Obisip Mandelstam famously called the Wolfhound Century. Accounts of the horrors and destruction across the former Russian Empire triggered in many countries either a, a frantic terror of Bolshevism or of a white fascist determination to crush all forms of socialism and even liberalism. This impersonal cruelty a political ideology and the frenzied violence of the enraged mob created a vicious circle of fear and loathing, which led eventually to the Spanish Civil War and then the Second World War. So although historians recognize the First World War as the original catastrophe of the 20th century, it was its aftermath, the extended Russian Civil War, which became the most influential conflict of the age, all the way through to the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989, 
or rather 1992, after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Fratricidal wars are bound to be cruel because of their lack of definable front lines, because of their instant extension into civilian life, and because of the terrible hatreds and suspicions which they engender. Yet the brutality of the Russian onslaught, which we have seen in Ukraine, has raised a debate about its origins. For example, David Aronovich in the London Times speculated about what he called this casual savagery of Russian troops. There can certainly be no doubt that no other nation is much as a as much as, as much a prisoner of their own past and history and myths, <clears throat> even if one can never generalize about Russia with all of its different component nationalities and its historic split between Slavophiles and Westerners going all the way back to Peter's idol, uh, to Putin's idol, Peter the Great. Above all, there can be no such thing as a DNA-based national character. Yet at the same time, most countries are often influenced, at least subconsciously, by a certain self-image or national narrative. And this is certainly true of Russia, with its belief ever since the Mongol invasions of the 13th century, that it is always surrounded by hostile forces, Rus contra mundum. Perhaps ever since those invasions, the Russian attitude has been conditioned to the idea that conspicuous violence and cruelty is a natural weapon of war. Fire and sword, terror, rape and looting were essential components of the civil war. They also emerged in the Second World War as a revenge for the barbarous Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union. And we see them again in Ukraine, uh, yet the most grotesque aspect of Putin's war against Ukraine is his <coughs> self-hypnotized conviction that it is somehow a replay of the victory over Nazism. But that's a subject we'll come back to later. Even just after the First World War's unprecedented slaughter, outside observers could hardly believe the brutality of the battles right across the former Russian Empire. For example, on the 4th of April, 1919, the captain of the Royal Navy destroyer, HMS Montrose, wrote home from the Crimean coast, I called on Colonel Count Rimsky-Korsakov, who commanded the remnants of the Tsarist lifeguards. He asked me to send his compliments to the Colonel of our first lifeguards. Poor chaps, no wonder they looked a party of ruffians as they sat in the low cottage living room. The small dirty window dimly illuminated the filthy table they fed around. War has made fiends of the illiterate, simple-minded, superstitious Russian peasants and devils of the reckless, drunken, pleasure-loving aristocracy they wish to exterminate. Both sides are equally barbarous, and the torture applied to prisoners is so inhuman, inhuman that I cannot write it here. Every man carries a grenade fastened to his tunic button with which to blow off his own head if he's captured. In the centuries before the revolution, which overthrew the Romanov dynasty, the Russian Empire had suffered occasional explosions of terrifying violence. The insurrection of 1773, led by the Cossack peasant Yemelian Pugachev, prompted Alexander Pushkin to write of Russian revolt, senseless and merciless. The great writer Maxim Gorky, who knew the reality of the oppressed poor better than any Bolshevik, had no doubts. During that revolution of February 1917, which overthrew the Tsarist regime, he visited the smoldering ruins of the Okhrana headquarters in Petrograd, the headquarters of the Tsarist secret police. And he predicted to the Menshevik, Nikolai Sukhanov, who accompanied him, that the revolution was bound to lead to Asiatic savagery. Gorky was not alone in his fear of the horrors to come. As the winter of 1917 approached, it brought a marked change in mood from heady optimism to fear. The young journalist Konstantin Paustovsky wrote that the misty romanticism of the February, February Revolution was rapidly evaporating, along with the belief in universal happiness. He described how the veteran writer Vladimir Gilyarovsky, with his sheepskin cap, extravagant moustache and hoarse voice, 
entered the newsroom. You suckling babes, he growled at all the idealistic youngsters present. Socialists, mouldering liberals. I know the Russian people and they'll show you yet where lobsters spend the winters. Ideological civil wars in the 20th century almost always aroused more savagery than state-on-state -state wars because suspicions of fear of being surrounded by treachery are so much greater. Those trapped in enemy territory had to pretend to have political opinions they abhorred just to survive. And in societies such as Spain and Russia, where men felt obliged to demonstrate conspicuous courage, <coughs> the suppression of fear produced a truly explosive charge of violence when released. And although it is one thing to want to exterminate your enemies out of a combination of fear and hatred, that does not explain the degree of pointless cruelty which emerged in the Russian Civil War. Clearly, one factor in the violence came from the dehumanizing effects and trauma of the Eastern Front in the First World War. Trench life for Russian soldiers along the Eastern Front in 1917, running through the Baltic provinces, Belarusia, Galicia and Romania, was an inhuman experience. Having dug themselves into the ground, wrote Gorky, they live in rain and snow, in filth, in cramped conditions. They're being worn out by disease and eaten by vermin. They live like beasts. Many lacked boots and had to resort to vast shoes made from birch bark. Casualty clearing stations at the front were almost as primitive as in the Crimean War. Army censorship departments could have had little illusion about the state of morale at the front on reading soldiers' letters home. Many complained of being hopelessly outgunned by the German artillery and of the utterly callous attitudes of officers towards them. Men were either brutalised or traumatised by what they saw. Corpses are still lying there, wrote one in the letter. Ravens have already eaten their eyes and rats are crawling on the bodies. Oh my God, this terrible sight can neither be described or imagined. Another wrote about a mass grave which officers had ordered them to dig and fill with their own dead. We laid them in there, but as it was late, we covered half of the hole with earth and left the other half until the morning. We placed a sentry and it turned out that one of the dead climbed out of the hole at night and was found sitting on the edge of the grave while some others had been turning because they hadn't been killed, just wounded and shocked by the explosions of heavy shells. This happens quite often. Intense resentment was caused by the contrast in conditions between officers and men. Many officers retired each night to the warmth and relative comfort of peasant Isbas behind the front line, while their soldiers and sergeants were left in the cold and squalor of the trenches. During the pre-revolutionary winter of 1916 to 1917, criticism of the government of the Tsar's government in Petrograd did not just come from liberals from the left. Even the arch-conservative politician Vasily Shulgin was appalled by the irresponsibility of the rich, indifferent to the fact that Russian casualties were running at twice the rate of their German and Austro-Hungarian enemies. And here we are, he wrote bitterly, dancing the last tango on the breastworks of trenches choked with corpses. As the tumultuous year of 1917 advanced after the February Revolution, more and more soldiers deserted from the front. The refusal of local garrisons to obey orders out in the countryside rapidly upended the traditional order there. Although some enlightened landowners were tolerated or even protected by their peasants and house servants, almost all had to flee during the course of the year. There were comparatively few examples of landowners killed in the early spring of 1917, even though many manor houses were set ablaze. Yet in the charged atmosphere, a minor incident, especially when peasants or soldiers managed to seize a store of alcohol could lead to mindless violence. Around Mutsensk in May, some 5,000 peasants and soldiers, having looted a wine cellar and a vodka uh, distillery, went berserk and over three days set fire to estates in the area. They had an uncontrollable urge to smash, to set fire to or to defile the precious objects of the nobility and gentry. 
Yet their bitterness only increased when they found that destroying or defiling the past did not make the present any better. Even handing over everything to the peasants seemed to do little good. In her father's absence, the young princess Baturin addressed the local peasants who'd come en masse from the village of Inozemka. She told them that the family had already declared that the whole estate and manor house were theirs. I implore you, don't destroy, she said, don't demolish what is already yours. The peasants stood there silently, she wrote. They had come with poles and axes, with sacks, some brought carts. Someone in the crowd shouted out, one landlord is gone, there will come another. Take what you can while you can. And the rampage began. A horrified young Grand Duke and cousin of the Tsar admitted in his diary, the people's hatred has been brewing for, for too long. Yet it was not long before even poor peasants became, peasant pe became victims too. A former artillery officer, Alexander Makonin, received a letter from his small soldier orderly, who'd returned home to his small holding as the remains of the Tsarist army collapsed. The orderly recounted in this letter how a group of Bolsheviks had turned up at their izba and demanded that he surrender his only cow. I told them, he wrote to Makonin, that the cow was all I had left and that my youngest child needed milk so that I could not give her to them. Very well, they answered, we'll see to it that your brat does not need milk anymore. And in spite of my struggles, they tore my youngest child out of my arms and bashed her head in against a wall. Then they took my cow and left me with my dead baby. Although a friend of Lenin, Maxim Gorky attacked the way that the Bolshevik leader uh, <coughs> welcomed mass violence and destruction simply because it made the revolution irreversible. Lenin had calculated that once peasants had chased off or massacred landowning families and industrial workers had done the same to foremen, managers and factory owners, then they would feel forced to defend their gains. Yet Lenin, despite the Bolshevik promises of land and liberty, had every intention of seizing absolute control through the, uh, both land and industry through the Soviets for the state and party. With the same deliberate falsehoods, he promised peace to the soldiers while determined to turn the imperialist war against Germany into a universal civil war. On the 5th of December, a month after the Bolshevik coup d'etat, Lenin decided to establish his secret police, the Cheka, an acronym for the All Russia, All Russia Extraordinary Commission for Combating Counter-Revolution, Profiteering and Sabotage. Without any evidence, Lenin blamed the bourgeoisie for starving the cities by interfering with food supplies. The great communist theory of wreckers and saboteurs to explain away disastrous mistakes or incompetence thus began well before there was any organized opposition. Lenin's declaration of war later that same month could hardly have been clearer. War to the death against the rich and their hangers on, <coughs> the bourgeois intellectuals. He called for their extermination as lice, fleas, vermin and parasites. It was tantamount to a call for glass class genocide. I must just add here that the Soviet Union fought bitterly in, Uni in the United Nations in 1948 to prevent the inclusion of class genocide in the definition of the crime laid down in the Genocide Convention of the 9th of December, 1948. Lenin had every intention of totally transforming the whole of society throughout the former Russian Empire and beyond by violent upheaval. The writer, Viktor Shlosky, compare this reckless experiment to the story from an old Russian folktale in which a devil's apprentice boasts that he can rejuvenate an old man. To restore his youth, all he needed to do was first burn him up. So he set him on fire, but then he found he could not revive him. It was indeed a striking parable to illustrate Lenin's total disregard for humanity in his attempts to transform society with the creation of the new man, Homo Sovieticus. The Cheka's head, Felix Dzinkti, 
as a tall, emaciated pole from a background of impoverished nobility. He had a pale, ascetic, El Greco face, a wispy wizard's beard and hooded eyes. He was a true fanatic, devoted to a belief for which he would sacrifice everything, even his own health and sanity. Senior Bolsheviks remarked with a mixture of pride and fear that Felix would spare not even his own mother in the name of the revolution. Like his subsequent ally, Stalin, Zerzinski had trained for the priesthood before turning against the Christian religion. His determination to unmask every enemy and traitor was both pitiless and obsessive, and yet he was not addicted to bloodlust like some of his successors. The killings he left to others. Utterly incorruptible, he mortified the flesh with the purity of his stance against any form of privilege. He would not touch any food beyond the most basic ration, and his office, where he slept on the floor, wrapped in a greatcoat, was unheated at his insistence. Lenin granted the Cheka the right to torture and kill without trial or any judicial supervision. The mountain of caseloads, it became quicker and easier for Czechists to condemn each prisoner to death rather than investigate. Czechists found the romanticization of violence combined with self-sacrifice intoxicating. In an anthology published by the Cheka, one of their executioners produced these verses. There is no greater joy nor better music than the crunch of broken lives and bones. This is why when our eyes are languid and passion begins to seethe stormily in the breast, I want to write on your sentence one unquavering thing. Up against a wall, shoot. The Cheka called itself the sword and flame of revolution. This summed up the Bolsheviks' idealized ruthlessness, elevating their cause above any human concern, such as natural justice or respect for life. Chazinsky had hoped to recruit men with his own spiritual purity and create a, a Bolshevik elite. He issued them with the black leather, leather aviator jackets, which had been provided earlier by the British government for the fledgling Tsarist Air Force. It became a uniform. The advantage of leather was that, unlike wool, it resisted the infestation of typhus-bearing lice. So, under Bolshevism, black leather became a symbol of privilege and authority. The Cheka seemed to revel in its reputation for nocturnal terror. Jerzynski only works at night, wrote the historian Grigory Aronson. Ordinary investigators imitate their bosses. They are shooting people at night in different parts of Moscow and in Cheka basements and sheds. Those already in prison used to refer to commissar death coming in the night. In a foretaste of the Nazi death squads in Russia, less than a quarter of a century later, the Cheka's prisoners were forced to undress completely so that their clothes could be reused. They were then made to kneel in cellars or by open graves so that their executioners only had to raise their heavy mouths of pistols with wooden stocks and shoot them in the back of the head. Some Cheka's gloried in the bloodshed, while others were driven insane by the relentless slaughter, just as Himmler discovered later with his own Einsatzgruppen. Jasinski claimed that the ideal Czechist had a burning heart, a cool head and clean hands. But Lenin knew only too well that the Cheka was also bound to attract criminals, killers and psychopaths. The Bolsheviks maintained that it was Fanny Kaplan's attempted assassination of Lenin in August 1918, which triggered the Red Terror. Yet the practice and mindset was already there. So their leadership knew that outside the larger cities of the North, their supporters were often in a minority. Terror, Lenin believed, was a vital weapon of war if only to secure the neutrality uh, or apathy of the majority. Yet even if the fears created during a civil war explain the compulsion to kill your enemies, they do not explain where the extremes of pointless torture and sadism came from. Was all this just an atavistic part of Pushkin's mindless and merciless depiction of Russian revolt, 
or had the frenzy of vengeance been intensified to another level by the rhetoric of political hatred. The horrors, it must be said, took place mostly far from Moscow in, in local checkers over which Zerzinkstyosin had little control. His hope that Cheka operatives would keep cool heads was in vain amid the butchery, as he too discovered. The new year of 1919 opened with a strange scene inside the Kremlin walls. Szerzynski himself, usually a man of iron self-control, became hopelessly drunk. He begged Lenin and Kamenev to shoot him. I spilt so much blood, he told them, that I no longer have the, any right to live. The start of 1919, the decisive year of the Civil War, was truly a period of mixed military fortunes for both Reds and Whites across the huge Eurasian landmass. The White Finns under General Mannerheim had triumphed with German help the year before and stood within striking distance of Petrograd. A small White Russian force also threatened Petrograd from Estonian territory but it was singularly ill-led by General Yudinich, who managed to antagonize both Estonians and Finns with his Russian imperial arrogance. There were Allied forces and uh, British command in North Russia based on Murmansk and Archangel. They uh, hoped to link up with Czech forces advancing from Siberia, nominally under the command of Admiral Kolchak, the supreme ruler of the White Alliance. In southern Russia and the Caucasus, the white commander-in-chief was General Anton Denikin. His position was secured by British support and supplies, uh, <laughs> as well as the sudden agreement of the Don Cossack host so to submit to his leadership. Their army had just suffered a series of bloody reverses <laughs> in attempts to capture Tsaritsyn on the Volga. Its ruthless defense allowed Stalin to claim credit for this victory and later to order the city the name of Stalingrad. <coughs> Denikin, the leader of the volunteer army, which was essentially czarist, imperialist in belief, now also commanded the Don army and soon also an army of the Caucasus under the far more charismatic General Baron Wrangel. Wrangel was a brilliant cavalry officer tall, slim, with sunken eyes and an iron determination. But his ambition became obsessive. He could never conceal his contempt for the avuncular Denikin. That January, just as the Reds were celebrating their success against the Don Cossacks on the lower Volga and a rapid advance across southern Ukraine, Wrangel took them by surprise. His Kuban Cossacks caught up with their 11th Army, already weakened by a typhus epidemic on its way northwest to Rostov-on-Don. <coughs> the main battle started near Petrovskoy, where Wrangel concentrated the best part of his 8,000 sabers. The Red Forces of the 11th Army took up what seemed to them to be an impregnable position along a nearby ridge. But then they sighted Wrangel squadrons mounting the steep incline in silence. The Cossacks simply ignored the Reds' erratic and ill-aimed fire. This self-control unsettled the defenders badly. The Red conscripts soon lost their nerve and began to flee. The Kuban Cossacks pursued the scattered mass for 18 kilometers, sabering them down as they ran. They surrounded the main force near the village of Spitsevka. After a fearful massacre, they marched the 5,000 survivors who surrendered back to Petrovskoya. For the first time since the start of the Civil War, wrote a young Cossack officer of horse artillery, prisoners were not shot, there were too many of them. At a halt, the Kuban Cavalry Division formed a huge open square. An order was shouted. The troopers and horse gunners came to attention. A triumphant wrangle on his magnificent black charger galloped into the center. He was wearing full Cossack uniform, the Chakeska with cartridge cases sewn diagonally on the chest, the black Papacha Zestrakhan hat, which he wore sideways almost on the back of his head, and a woolen burka cloak. 
Thank you, my eagles, he shouted to them, and they answered with a deafening hurrah. Some claimed that even many of their prisoners were so carried away by the dramatic sight that they cheered too. Brangle's victory over the Red's 11th Army also forced their 12th Army to pull back to Astrakhan, and this enabled Denikin's volunteer army in February to capture all the major towns as far as the Caucasus mountain range and join up with the Terek Cossacks. Trotsky was shaken to the core by this disaster inflicted on their Caspian Caucasus front by a far smaller force. It proved exactly what he had feared. The Red Army conscripts were still terrified of the Cossacks. He desperately needed mounted forces too in such a war and an intensive poster campaign proclaimed the unexpected communist slogan, proletarians to horse. Yet the white armies in stark contrast to the centralized red command stood little chance of organizing themselves for victory. They were an impossible alliance with moderate socialists losing out, losing out to reactionary monarchist officers landowners and anti-Semitic Cossacks who rejected any plan of renewal or reform. Any attempt at civil administration collapsed in corruption and chaos. The conservative majority just wanted to turn back the clock. Cavalry officers, when they had a chance, would ride out accompanied by Cossacks to take revenge on peasants who wrecked and robbed landed estates. White terror was not really a strategy of war imposed from above. It was much more an attitude of angry disbelief and resentment, unrestricted by a complete lack of command and control. Neither Admiral Konchak in Siberia, nor General Anton Denikin, the commander in chief of the armed forces of Southern Russia, had the ability or the determination to rein in their generals who blithely ignored orders to stop looting, pogroms, rape, and summary executions. The volunteer army, although better disciplined, could also rampage out of control at times, but without doubt, the Cossacks were the worst. A young Latvian cavalry officer called Martin Alp was forcibly recruited by General Mamontov's corps of Don Cossacks just before their great raid in October 1919 behind red lines we caught members of local Soviets, unawares in their villages, he wrote. Commissars and communists were shot straight away or hung on the winding gear of the wells. As for women, and women, their lives were normally spared, but all the young ones were raped. During their brief rest period after the raid, Alp was billeted together with several young Don Cossack officers who kept reproaching him. You fought side by side with us, but you don't want to join in when we're having fun. He replied as carefully as he could, I value you as my comrades in arms and I'm happy to sit at the table with you, but I don't want to drink with you. I was not able to change their behavior, Alp explained, but I resisted drinking with them and taking part in their orgies with women, especially with the arrested female communists among whom there were some principled good Russian women, even though they were communists. I felt a great pity for them when they were in the hands of those male dogs. Soon, I could no longer stand it. Alp managed to transfer to an infantry regiment. Even dubious causes can produce romantic legends of doomed self-sacrifice. On the 17th of February, 1920, the last hurrah of the white Tsarist cavalry took place in a battle on the Kuban steppe amid growing resentments between Cossacks and the Russian imperialists of the volunteer army. The brother of the 22-year-old Prince Alexei Cherkassy described his death in a poignant letter home written on British Red Cross writing paper. My dear beloved Papa, it was the Lord's will to send us the hardest ordeal. I beg you to accept it with the same strength and firmness as I have done. Our darling Alesha was killed in a cavalry battle around three or four in the afternoon of the 17th of February near Stalitsa, Stanitsa Egolinskaya. He died like a true hero. In that terrible battle, our integrated Guards Cavalry Regiment lost 11 officers and around 380 soldiers killed or wounded. General Barbovich was ordered to be in the first line attacking Budjoni's cavalry. 
a 10, almost a division of Cossacks, were supposed to follow behind with another Cossack division just behind them. However, one of these divisions only arrived an hour after the battle finished, and the other one never appeared at all. Our regiment was fighting on the left flank. It attacked, broke up the cavalry charge of the Reds, and started chasing them. It continued the chase across two streams. After that, the regiment attacked the enemy's reserve and caused great confusion. Alasha charged the Reds' Tachanka, but he managed to get away, so he attacked a Red battery. His horse was killed, but he bravely continued on foot, firing his Browning pistol. Alesha was seen for the last time reloading his pistol, after which he was attacked by a group of Reds. Mikhazki rushed to his rescue, but neither of them was seen after that. The Reds had a great numerical advantage, and all of them were armed with revolvers, so it was impossible to fight against them when we left with just our sabres. At that time, General Pavlov had a reserve of nearly 30 cavalry regiments. Damn those bloody Cossacks! that have left us down so badly. Like the Reds, the Whites kill prisoners or force them into their own ranks at the point of a barrel. Their worst atrocities, however, were committed out of bitterness during retreat and defeat. In July 1919, some 2,200 Jews are said to have been massacred or slaughtered by Admiral Kolchak's Northern Army in Yekaterinburg, the scene of the massacre of the Imperial family just before the Red Forces arrived. And in November of 1919, as Denikin's armies retreated after their overextended march on Moscow, they too committed atrocities in revenge for their failure. A Sergeant Berry from the British military mission managed to escape from the violent chaos in Belgorod as the Reds approached. He reported to his officers on what he'd seen of white vengeance before they pulled out of the town. Men and women accused of being pro-Bolshevik were hanged in the town square. They were simply strung up and drunken Cossacks hewed their arms and legs off with their swords while the wretched people were still alive. In Kiev, even the, that extreme reactionary Vasily Shulgin was shocked by the behavior of white officers from the volunteer army. In one house, they hung a commissar by the arms, made a fire underneath and slowly cooked him. The drunken gang of monarchists around him howled the old national anthem, God Save the Tsar. When it came to anti-Semitic pogroms, the whites were not the only perpetrators. It is estimated that there were some 1,300 anti-Semitic pogroms in Ukraine during the Civil War, with some 50,000 to 60,000 Jews killed by both sides. There were also pogroms in Belarus as well, but they were not as murderous as those in Ukraine. In total, a Soviet report of 1920 cites figures of uh, 150,000 Jews dead and as many again badly injured. In Ukraine and southern Russia, the Red Ataman Grigoriev had been the worst perpetrator, then followed by some of Semyon Petliura's Ukrainian nationalists and white Cossacks who assumed that all Jews were Bolsheviks. And yet all too often, Jews were also beaten up and killed by Red Army soldiers, thinking they were capitalists and bourgeois, including even impoverished market traders. Konstantin Paustovsky wrote of Kiev under the Whites in 1919. It stayed quiet for a while after Denikin took over. For the present, they were not touching the Jews. Occasionally, but only at some distance from the busier streets, a few whites with drug-crazed eyes prancing on their horses would sing their favourite song, Black Hussars Save Our Russia, Beat the Jews, for they are the Commissars. But by the late autumn of 1919, after Soviet forces had retaken Orel and begun to drive southwards, the mood of the whites changed. Pogroms started in the little towns and villages of Ukraine. Outside their own territory, Cossacks acted all too often as if they were in an enemy country where anything was permitted. Red terror, however, did not slacken the closer their armies came to victory. Lenin's vocabulary of extermination spread not just through the Civil War, extended, it extended right into the Soviet-Polish War of 1920 as part of the 
Bolsheviks' plan to create world revolution by joining up with communists in Germany and Central Europe. Their commander-in-chief on the Western Front, the 27-year-old Mikhail Tukhachevsky, was under pressure to capture Warsaw before the middle of August. His group of armies, nearly 100,000 strong, were bombarded with propaganda. On the 3rd of July, the eve of a major assault, they were read a proclamation. The time of reckoning has come. In the blood of the defeated Polish army, we will drown the criminal government of Pulsudski. The world, <coughs> fate of world revolution is being decided. Over the corpse of white Poland lies the road to world conflagration. On our bayonets, we will bring happiness and peace to the toiling masses of mankind. Polish peasant families who experienced the first Red Cavalry Army's looting sprees for pigs, chickens, or girls would not have recognized their bayonets or sabers as instruments of either happiness or peace. The first cavalry army was commanded by Stalin's crony, Semyon Budioni. His Konamia, as it was known, was the most notorious when it came to the final act with Frunze's invasion of the Crimea in November 1920. Its progress into the peninsula was slow because of the revenge it was taking, taking on the way. The nurse, Anya Ivanovna Egorova, rejoined her colleagues in a white army field hospital which had just been overrun by Budioni's troopers. They had been stripped of all their clothes, she wrote. The nurses had been raped. Their faces were red from being beaten up. It was done by Budjani's cavalry. The doctors, too, were crying. All the nurses' faces were red. They cried while they were being raped, and the troopers had slapped their faces, demanding that they laugh. The doctors had turned away when the nurses were being abused. A man from Budjani's cavalry approached the doctor who had looked away and punched him in the face. You should be happy to see us here. Do you have any idea who Budjoni is? Moral virtue was hard to find anywhere in such a conflict, apart from perhaps support, support, sorely put upon peasant women still sharing the last of their food with starving refugees. Even that arch conservative Shulgin believed that one of the major reasons for the collapse of the whites was due to moral, whereas for the failure of the whites was due to moral collapse that they behaved as badly as their Bolshevik enemy. There was nevertheless one subtle yet important difference between the two sides. All too often, many of the whites represented the worst examples of humanity. For ruthless inhumanity, however, the Bolsheviks were unbeatable. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Sir Anthony. Um, just to let everybody know, we are gonna have a Q&A session now. So if you have questions, um, there's a button below. Uh, it's a Q&A button. You can type your uh, question for Sir Anthony um, and I will uh, get around to, that, uh, to those questions as soon as possible. Uh, to start things off, I am going to ask uh, the first question, maybe two, depending on how many, uh, how many questions come in um, from the audience. So please, at this time, um, begin your uh, begin your questions while I ask uh, Sir Anthony the very first question. And uh, the, my first my question is this, Sir Anthony. So the, um, the 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 new words in vogue today um, are the are the words, and I'm sure many people have heard this. The term "a useful idiot." Yeah. Um, so let's speak about Alexander Kerensky. Was Alexander Kerensky either a very useful idiot or was he someone simply politically outmatched by Lenin? Um, was he someone uh, who simply did not quite understand what was going on in Russia uh, during the first, uh, at the end of the First World War, did not understand the malaise and as you had mentioned, the kind of moral collapse of the, uh, of the Russian people. Um, Talk a little bit about Alexander Kerensky and his, uh, was, was he a failure? Did he, did he do his best? What, what, are, what are your thoughts? He was a brilliant speaker, but also a fantasist. The trouble was that he was the only person really uh, at soon after the uh, February revolution 
who could bring the only uh, two organizations capable of leading towards the ideal of a constituent assembly uh, together. And this was the conservative, um, centrist conservative uh, group from the Duma, led by Rodzianko, uh, but also the Petrograd Soviet, um, which wasn't Bolshevik at all. It was basically socialist. Um, and he completely underestimated the ability of the Bolsheviks to have any influence because they were tiny. Uh, and remember, none of them had, be, had, had any involvement in the February Revolution at all. Uh, most of their leaders were all abroad and didn't even know that a revolution that the Tsar had been overthrown. You had uh, Stalin in, uh, still in exile in uh, Siberia, uh, Trotsky in North America, and uh, Lenin in Switzerland. Um, and of course, they were struggling to get back to take part as soon as they heard the news. Now, Kerensky um, somehow uh, took over from Prince Lov, who was the uh, first, uh, shall we say, prime minister of the uh, provisional government, as it became known. But the provisional government had no power at all. The police had all been disbanded. Um, the countryside was in chaos. And um, they, although they were, had ministries uh, and levers or whatever, but they, those levers weren't attached to any, any form of power. But Kerensky thought that purely by his uh, emotional speeches to the troops, he could keep Russia in the war, which he had been promised to the Western allies. And one has to remember that France actually had been basically financing uh, Russia uh, almost on its own. The British had also contributed and obviously the Americans as well, but um, not to the same degree. So out of this feeling that he could uh, inspire the armies, he had all of these great uh, visits to the front. And many of the soldiers were literally in tears and swore that they would fight on to the end of the war. Um, and yet many observers realized that this was totally superficial, that it would, could collapse at the moment of a battle. And so Kerensky launched this uh, big offensive, it was known really often as the Kerensky offensive, which turned into the biggest disaster possible for the Russian army. And that was the moment of real complete disintegration. But he continued on really as the leader of the provisional government. Um, and um, again, completely underestimated the needs or the, uh, sorry, the uh, strength uh, or the abilities of the Bolsheviks. And Lenin, through sheer determination, uh, realized that actually uh, they, would act, they could easily mount a coup d'etat. And they used uh, the opportunity when General Kornilov uh, was encouraged to try to not mount a coup, but in fact, basically to sort of stiffen the army after its collapse. Um, and um, unfortunately, Kerensky and uh, Kornilov completely misunderstood the situation. And Kerensky, believing there was going to be a coup from the right, then almost threw himself into the arms of the extreme left and allowed the communists to start infiltrating key positions, uh, especially in the counterintelligence and other areas and communications. And they took over the telephone exchanges and so forth. And this gave them the ideal position to launch their coup later. But right up until the end, um, Kerensky was coming up with factuous uh, claims that um, you know he was completely in control and that there was no threat from the uh, Bolsheviks at all. Um, and then he, on the day, of course, after, in fact, the very night day of the uh, coup d'etat, of the Bolsheviks coup d'etat and, uh, and the so-called October Revolution, um, he, had to, he had to flee from Petrograd uh, in a car from the American embassy. Apparently, he was dressed in a Serbian uniform. But anyway, uh, that was really the end of uh, Kerensky. So, no, he, uh, he, he completely failed to uh, achieve anything that actually he set out to do. Was that because he was just trying the middle road all the time? He never really he never really tried to go to the either left or the right to appease. He tried to appease all sides and- He tried to appease all sides, but at the same time, um, he certainly faced a very difficult position because, um, uh, which is uh, to be fair to him, um, the, the whole question was to create the, the Constituent Assembly uh, which would be the um, 
parliament and the future of Russian democracy. Uh, but this was partly sabotaged by the Russians, who then, when it finally met, uh, by the sorry, by the communists. Uh, but when it, they finally met, they just disbanded it. Um, but the problem was that um, it was delayed and delayed because of disagreements, and this only created greater frustrations amongst the peasants and the soldiers and the factory workers, who wanted to know, wanted to know or have confirmed the fact that they'd taken over whatever it was and uh, that they had the right to it. So uh, they had very little uh, time for the uh, provisional government. And it's really what Alexander Herzen, a century before, um, in the middle of the 19th century, had predicted as the problem of the, the pregnant widow, this, this interregnum between, um, between two regimes, where obviously the uh, powers that be actually have no powers at all uh, and are totally vulnerable. And that was a tragedy for Russia. I think we have a couple of questions, but I'm going to ask one more. Hopefully we can get a couple more questions coming in. And my last question before I get to the questions of our patrons here is that of the uh, the Cossacks. You had mentioned the Cossacks quite a bit during uh, during your lecture. I, I've wrote on them extensively. Um, my uh, my question is that the, the Cossacks obviously were a, a very ultra nationalist force of the Tsar, um, and yet we see. Uh, we, of course, we know about the what happened in 1905 during the for very first the 1905 revolution, and then you write actually quite quite well about the issues going on in the the, re the revolution in, in March, where the Cossacks actually refuse, um, are actually standing down. And uh, some of them, I think you recount a story where uh, one, they say, we're, we're not gonna have another 1905 again. We are not going to you know, um, mow down the civilians in Petrograd like we did in, in 1905. And yet we see this kind of reactionary Cossackdom um, again in 1919, where they kind of revert back to being more on the white side. Um, talk a little bit about your views of, uh, of the Cossacks um, and their kind of back and forth and eventually elimination. And maybe if you will, um, the kind of revitalization under Putin with Cossacks, the, the, the kind of new czarist Cossacks, yeah. if you will. Well, um, yeah, there's quite a lot there. Um, no, the Cossacks, um, one has to remember, one mustn't generalize, um, uh, which is, should be the duty of every um, historian is to fight generalizations. Uh, towards the end of the war, not surprisingly, many Cossacks, especially the younger ones, and some of them became really quite left wing, um, were um, no longer sort of the bizarrest loyalists, which the, the older generation tended to remain. It was, it was quite often a generational thing. Um, and that's why we'd start to see a split um, during the course of uh, later in 1917, where the uh, older Cossacks who still believed in their sort of uh, oath to the Tsar and all the rest of it, uh, were horrified by lots of the younger Cossacks returning from the front, um, who simply didn't want to even fight against the um, growing threat from the Reds, uh, and especially in their own sort of areas, uh, where there started to be also tension with the non-Cossacks, uh, Inger Ardnir, um, the when one started to see uh, a, a slight rupture. But then once the Reds really attacked, uh, and especially when the uh, um, the the, um, the Don Cossacks uh, were unable really to uh, hold them off during the course of that winter of uh, 1917 to 1918, um, then that rather focused their minds and uh, um, they saw or felt that, uh, you know, it was going to have to be war to the death with the Reds. Um, and that is why we started to see them in a much greater uh, strengthening of their sort of fighting power um, until right at the end, when again, uh, we start to see the splits, uh, especially with the monarchists, because during the course of uh, that period under Ataman Krasnov, uh, I'm now talking very much more of 1918, the time of the uh, German occupation <coughs> of Western Russia and especially Ukraine, um, the Cossacks wanted to carve out their own independent region, as you know, any too well, Joe, um, and to have a sort of Cossack federation. 
uh, <coughs> which of course was anathema um, to the greater Russian imperialist. And this, this tension really between uh, Denikin and uh, the imperialists uh, and uh, the Cossacks and especially the Kuban Cossacks and the, uh, and the Don Cossacks um, really started to lead to a disintegration right at the end as we, uh, as we know. Uh, as for Putin, yes, of course, um, he adores uh, the Cossacks, partly because of their ferocity, um, their fighting history, their increase of the Russian Empire. I mean, the Russian Empire was basically created by the Cossacks with uh, not just the advance uh, uh, south into uh, Ukraine and uh, and then, um, I mean, or from Ukraine and then into uh, the Caucasus, uh, but especially um, eastwards all the way, and then all of the different Siberian Cossack hosts, uh, which were created, uh, many of them the most ferocious, most cruel of all. Um, and as we know, Putin um, is much more a supporter of the whites um, than of the Reds. He may have spoken about the great geopolitical tra tragedy of the collapse of the Soviet Union. But all of the symbols around him in the uh, Kremlin um, are all are all uh, imperial. They're all czarist. Um, and I mean, the his palace on the Black Sea is uh, decorated with golden double headed eagles in all directions. And he brought back uh, the bodies of General Denikin and General Kapol of uh, uh, famous sort of white generals for reburial and for erecting uh, monuments in their honor. Uh, to the horror of many Soviet loyalists, not surprisingly, I suppose. Um, so the, the, the and even the, um, if you like, the, the great sort of Slav nationalist, uh, semi-fascist idea uh, that the whole Eurasian landmass from uh, Vladivostok right through to Dublin, of all places, um, should be uh, taken over by the Slavic uh, Orthodox uh, purity and spirituality uh, rather than Western uh, corruption um, is a sort of a fundamental part of Putin uh, uh, Putin's thinking and of many of those still around him in the inner circle of the Kremlin. So uh, uh, it's, it's all linked into that. There's a sort of uh, uh, the idea of the idea of the Cossacks in any sort of spiritual form. Um, it may seem a slight contradiction, but uh, it's certainly there in his mentality. Next question comes from uh, Gleaves Whitney, the executive director of the Gerald R. Ford Foundation. And he asks, uh, Sir Anthony, to what extent were the Russian revolutionaries students of the French Revolution and its terror? Well, to, to a very large degree at the beginning, um, that is absolutely true. You know, they they sang the Marseillaise, um, a sort of rather um, a rather heavy uh, Russian version. Um, I don't think it had the sort of the brio or the panache of the uh, of the French one. Um, but I mean, they, all parallels were made with the French Revolution time and time again, and to a certain degree also with the uh, communar, uh, <coughs> with the communar of 1870 uh, or 1871. But um, particularly with the Red French Revolution, I mean, the whole business of red and white comes from the French Revolution with the <coughs> the red Phrygian caps of the French revolutionaries and the white cockade of the Bourbon uh, on the other side. Um, even some of the killing methods came from the French Revolution, not the guillotine, but um, the noyade, the, um, the sinking of uh, uh, barges with uh, prisoners tied up on board and in rivers and uh, off the coast. Um, numbers of things like that. So there were constant parallels in that particular way. Uh, the fact of uh, um, there was always, uh, therefore, a debate on who would be the Napoleon of the French Revolution. And Kerensky at times thought that he would be the Napoleon of the French Revolution. Um, so did General Kornilov. Um, and, um, and then sort of later, you know, others sort of uh, thought that they might uh, take it on that particular role. So these historical parallels, which of course always turned out to be completely uh, misleading, uh, were very much a, a part of the time. Uh, next question comes from my um, actually much better half, uh, Tatiana Westfall, and she asks, how many assassination attempts were there made against Lenin? Who was behind them and why did they fail? 
Well, the the sort of first ones were, were but one evening, and it wasn't a very effective one, where shots, revolver shots were fired at his car uh, by two sort of unidentified anti-Bolsheviks. Um, and one night, I mean, it was right at the beginning of um, right at the beginning of 1918. Um, the most important one, of course, was the Fanny Kaplan. Uh, she fired. Uh, she managed to hit him with two shots. One sort of, I think, within was not fatal at all or dangerous, uh, but the one of them got him in the neck, um, and he very, very nearly died. I mean, there's no doubt about it. He was just saved by a uh, by sort of uh, good good uh, doctors. Um, but this was important in the sense that it was a. Um, uh, the moment when he actually became part of a personality cult, um, the 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 anger uh, amongst sort of you know loyal Bolsheviks was so intense, um, <clears throat> and um, his portrait then suddenly became. Um, I mean, he hadn't been funny enough up until uh, even the Bolshevik coup d'état, but you nobody knew what his face looked like. Um, now, suddenly, you know, there were photographs everywhere and um, people even used to cut them out of uh, uh, newspapers and stick them up where they'd had uh, um, icons before with a candle in front of it um, in sort of what was sort of became now no longer the holy corner, but the red corner uh, in their sort of peasant dispers. Those were for obviously loyal co communists. Uh, but there was definitely a sort of uh, um, a... Um, uh, a sort of secular sainthood uh, created around him, and which, of course, uh, Stalin then sort of tried to profit from later. Um, you know, with his uh, his image up there with uh, with Lenin. Um, but basically, um, Lenin was not known for a great deal of uh, uh, physical courage, um, and he spent most of his time guarded by his uh, Latvian bodyguards. Um, um, from the uh, Latvian Rifle Division um, behind Kremlin walls, or um, it, when, as soon as they once they'd moved to once they'd moved to Moscow. Um, so um, on the whole, when it came to um, even before the actual revolution, um, Lenin was pretty cautious uh, on where he went on meetings and so forth. Uh, but that was th those were the sort of the two most two most important, um, and uh, as I say, this was in many ways part of the foundation of the of the Lenin myth uh, that uh, um, he was he was sort of you know in a country which had been shall we say so focused on religion on the orthodox religion, um, Lenin was turned into a form of uh, uh, surrogate uh, surrogate saint. We have uh, time for one last question, uh, and that comes from uh, Christine Wild Wildboar, um, and she asks, uh, it was mentioned that there were uh, anti-Jewish attacks. I am wondering if it was a repeat of a pattern seen elsewhere that the attacks on Jews preceded greater attacks on various parts of the population leading to or as part of a growth in nationalism. Um it's an interesting uh, question of to what degree German and Russian uh, anti-Semitism um, developed in different ways uh, and affected each other. I mean, the the sort of the German um, uh, nationalism uh, ideas of racial purity, I think, actually were rather different. Uh, so I'm slightly cautious on that. I think there's no doubt about it that uh, Russian anti-Semitism uh, certainly seemed to affect German anti-Semitism after the revolution. Um, but anyway, the point was that um, beforehand, the Black Hundreds, as they were called, uh, which were actually were supported by Tsar Nicholas II, um, were in many ways the creation or the stimulus for young Jews, particularly well-educated or uh, and extremely intelligent, uh, to support the Bolsheviks, and this then became a sort of a vicious circle. It convinced the whites um, that basically, sort of, you know, all Jews were Bolsheviks by definition, which was certainly not the case. Um, many of them, 
many of them were actually um, sort of horrified because uh, it meant that, um, you know, those who'd been um, even, as I was saying, market traders, uh, but certainly those who had been merchants purely because they weren't allowed to own land and therefore they could never be farmers, uh, or particularly if they were corn merchants, uh, they were always suspected of having cheated the peasants uh, in the sale or the purchase of, of corn. Um, so that was one of the, the sort of great uh, vulnerabilities in that particular way. Um, there was also the question of, um, and then we go much further forward in history, uh, when it came to the uh, uh, great Ukrainian famine, um, the communists uh, tried to pass around rumors that actually it was the Jews who were responsible for the famine, not the Soviets, uh, which was perhaps one of the contributions why to the idea of, of, of some uh, Ukrainians when the Germans invaded that, uh, uh, that it really had been the fault of the Jews. And, uh, uh, and that was why many or uh, a number of uh, uh, Ukrainians actually had joined the uh, Germans and uh, and even became uh, concentration camp guards. So the interrelationship between that very, very um, in curious uh, and important relationship between Germany and Russia, uh, not just in terms of the conflict of the Second World War, but uh, of earlier, um, is an area for certainly an always greater, greater study. Uh, and particularly the way that um, Russian anti-Semitism uh, did feed into, uh, from the whites, did feed into uh, German Nazism uh, and its own version of uh, extreme anti-Semitism as well. Um, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Sir Anthony for uh, providing this wonderful lecture. I had one more question here, but this is more of an administrative question I will answer myself. And that is, um, will there will this recording um, have closed captions? Um, this is one of the issues with Zoom, um, and I can I can say that many of our previous Zoom lectures, as well as many of our lectures that we've had on our YouTube page during the pandemic, we did trans uh, did started a transcribing. Um, can't promise to say to say when we'll get around to doing this one. Uh, but it is something that we will certainly put on our docket. And thank you, Lynn, for that uh, for that great question. And now I will turn things over to the executive director of the Gerald R. Ford Foundation and our partner, please, Whitney. Well, thank you so much, Joel, and and thank you, Sir Anthony, for just another really enlightening and wonderful uh, presentation, a chilling depiction of the 1917 Russian Revolution and its aftermath is a cataclysm that continues to impact Russia, Ukraine, and the world profoundly a century later, as you uh, so ably pointed out. A shout out also to our friends of Ford who underwrite this and so many other programs we host, and to my good partners at the Gerald R. Ford Library and Museum, Brooke Clement and Joel Westfall and their wonderful staff. You know, programs like Sir Anthony's are what make the Ford a truly special place. If your mind was enriched, if your perspective was challenged, if you enjoyed learning something new and fascinating, then we hosted a successful event. And we, we hope you will follow up by visiting the outstanding collections in the Ford Presidential Library in Ann Arbor and the illuminating exhibits in the Ford Presidential Museum in Grand Rapids. Also, if you're not already, please consider becoming a friend of Ford and help support our efforts to sign up and see our upcoming programs and exhibits. Visit our website, which will appear on your screen in just a moment. There we will find an array of resources to learn more about our 38th president and his virtue anchored leadership, which is very much needed these days in America and beyond. So thank you for joining us in the important work we do. I'm Gleaves Whitney, wishing you a good day.